Thank you. In 1903, humans flew for the very first time. This is the Wright brothers and Kitty, and Kitty Hawk. In 1969, humans flew for the very first time supersonic. It boggles my mind that there were people on this planet in 1969 who could fly from Paris to New York in three hours and did remember humans not flying at all. Now, let me welcome you to your exponential future and let me take you on a little bit of a, of a roller coaster ride. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you the one week executive program which we sell you to for $15,000 in about 15 minutes. So sit tight, it's going to be fast. So we talk about this, this idea of exponential technologies. And an exponential trend, if you remember your math class, is a very classic curve like this. Every time we have a doubling, so you go from 1 to 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, we see technology move on this trend curve. And the most um, famous one of these trend curves is Moore's Law. This is Gordon Moore, the uh, co-inventor of um, Intel. And Moore's Law states that the number of transistors per square inch doubles every about two years. This is the reason why computers are so powerful. In layman's terms, this means computers get twice as fast at the same price performance ratio every two years. Now, this is a Cray-1 supercomputer. It was built in 1975. In today's dollars, this thing would cost you about 36 million US dollars. This computer already had more compute power than all of the compute power NASA had together to put the man on the moon. So this is 1975. This computer had a compute power of 80 megaflops, so 80 million floating point operations per second. If you pull out your iPhone, and this is not even the latest generation, this iPhone cost you 150 thousandth of the price of a Cray-1 supercomputer, and it has a thousand times the compute power. In your pocket today, you hold a thousand Cray-1 supercomputers. But this is not the end of it. So you take this guy here. This is a Pi Zero. It just came out about three months ago. This is the size of a pack of gum. It cost you $5, which is the price today you pay for a Starbucks venti latte. And it has 191 megaflops. This is two and a half times the supercompute power you had in 1975, and only large corporations could afford. Now a child can buy this on their milk money. Or you take this guy here, this is the Drive PX2. This is the computer which is the heart, the brains of the self-driving car. This computer has 24 teraflops, costs you less than $1,000. This computer, compared to the Cray-1 in terms of price performance ratio, is 10 billion times better. So this is where computers are going. But there's something really important to understand. We as humans are wired to think linearly because our world evolved linearly. The seasons come and go. The harvest comes every year at the same time. And for the last 250,000 years, minus the last 3,000 years, the sable-toothed tiger tried to kill us every winter. The easiest way to explain to you how this works, our brains being linearly wired when the technology world moves on exponential trends, is to think about what we call the linear exponential deception. Here's the example. If you take 30 linear steps, one after the other. For me, this would be probably back to the, uh, the entrance of the backstage. This is a 30-meter distance. You have a very good intuitive feel for how far this is. Now, imagine we would take 30 exponential steps. So every step is twice as far as the, the other. So we go from 1 to 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on. Try to figure out how far this is. I can guarantee you, you typically hear, I typically when I ask a smaller group, I will not put you on the spot here, when you ask a smaller group, you get two answers. The first answer is, it's a mile or one kilometer. Somehow that feels intuitive to a lot of people. And then there's the people who are sitting there and saying, well, Pascal already told me about these exponential trends, and they're like the smarty kitties. They tell me it's to the sun. It's a good guess, but then I ask them, how far is to the sun? And they don't know. So, to solve this mystery for you, it's 25 times around the planet. This, by the way, is the power of exponential trends. So where you have a linear trend, you go 30 steps or 30 meters. Now we go 25 times around the Earth. It's 1 billion meters. This is what we call the linear exponential deception. Now, there's an interesting piece in there. When you start mapping these curves against each other, the linear and the exponential curve, there's three interesting pieces in this curve, and they are really important to understand. The first curve is 
disappointment. Because linear trends start very, very, very slowly. And your linear brand, sorry, exponential trends, your linear brain wants these things to be better. The classic example is Google Glass. Google Glass is too expensive, the battery life is terrible, the functionality isn't great, and you look like a complete idiot wearing it. So what you're doing is you're disappointed. Now the danger is when you're disappointed, you're dismissing it. But then comes something which we call the iPhone moment. This is when Steve Jobs gets on stage, shows the world for the very first time the iPhone, and you know, you intuitively know that your old Nokia brick phone is a thing of the past. And then you come to this world where we have chaos and amazement. Chaos and amazement is Kenya today has 7% smartphone penetration. 90% of Kenyans have a phone, a dumb phone, and 7% have a smartphone. That number is expected to rise to 90% smartphone penetration in the next three years. Overnight, Kenya will become internet connected. Now, if you're a business, I recently talked to the largest bank in Kenya. They even understand this trend. But they are very, very clearly understanding that if they are not going to be a mobile-first bank in three years' time, latest, they are dead. Because someone else will take them uh, on the punching ground and uh, displace them. Another model to think about this future is what Peter Diamandis, one of our co-founders, calls the six Ds of disruption. And let me uh, walk you through this model. And it's a very simple but very powerful model to understand where these exponential trends are going. This gentleman here is the inventor of the digital camera. So the very camera you're currently holding up to take a picture of it. This gentleman worked for a company called Kodak. Ironically, the company which got displaced by um, digital cameras. And this very first digital camera, as you can see, is a really unwieldy big thing. It had 0.01 megapixels. It was terrible. You plugged it into your television set, and you saw these big blocky pixels. So what happened is that Kodak Top Press dismissed this. But here's what happens in the 60s of disruption. The first is, the moment an analog technology becomes digitized, it starts to move on an exponential curve. I cannot overstate it, how important this idea is. The moment something analog becomes digital, it automatically moves on an exponential curve. So for all of you who are entrepreneurs in the audience, find an industry which is analog today and disrupt it by becoming digital. I can guarantee you the payoff. These trends start out very slowly and they're deceptive. So the first digital camera had 0.01 megapixels. It was terrible. So what Kodak did was they looked at it and said, well, film will always be better. This is terrible. Film will always be better. Now, digital cameras move on a perfect exponential curve. So the next time this inventor of the digital camera came to the to Kodak top management and showed them the next prototype, it had 0.02 megapixels. And he repeated this a couple of years. So you go from 0.01 to 0.02, 0.04, 0.08, 0.16, by which time Kodak pulled the plug. Because the problem is, it all starts with a zero. They couldn't see the trend. Eventually, the stuff becomes disruptive. This is the moment when the curves cross. This is the moment for your digital camera when you had two megapixels. Two megapixels is enough to print a 9 by 13 print. This is the moment when you stop buying film. Then you start to dematerialize it. Most people in the audience don't even have a digital camera anymore because it became dematerialized. It's now a feature of your phone. It's not a thing anymore. It becomes software. Ultimately, you start demonetizing it. This is what the camera industry currently sees because nobody's buying cameras anymore outside of the professionals. And then you, make it then you turn it into a democratized system. Let me very quickly walk you through this with uh, Uber. Uber digitized the rider information. They took the information of like, where's the, the rider and where's the car? It was deceptive because the first time Uber did this, Uber did this with what is called black cars. They're luxury cars. So people looked at it and said, Uber is a thing for luxury uh, goods. It became disruptive when they started allowing people to use their own cars. They dematerialized car ownership. If I live in San Francisco, I do not need a car anymore because Uber replaces cars. If I want to drive, I do not need to buy a special car, a cab or a black car. I can just take the car I already have. You demonetize it. Uber is a good chunk cheaper than your cab. 
And ultimately, and this is the stated mission of Uber, is they want to democratize it. They want to put a rider into every seat in every car. This is the power of the 60s of disruption. Ray Kurzweil formulated this in a uh, law of accelerating returns. This is a generalization of this law. And there's something interesting to look at. What we're seeing is this is a graph with actual data. What Ray Kurzweil was interested in is to look at Moore's law and determine if this Moore's law stays stable over long periods of time. This is a logarithmic plot, which is the reason why you don't see it as an exponential, uh, but a linear plot. And he looked at different technologies. So as technologies move from one to the other, they still stay on an exponential trend curve. This is 110 years of data, absolutely perfectly stable. Despite wars and uh, uproar and breakthroughs in technology, it's always been stable. Now, you can do something fun with this. Assume this graph stays true for the future. And there's no reason not to believe this, because it's a 110-year trend already. You can determine the point in the future when you will have a single computer which has the raw compute power of the human brain. One human brain and one computer, which will happen in the year 2029, give or take. Now, you can go really crazy, and it becomes a little more nebulous, but you can determine the point in the future when you have a computer with the raw compute power of all human brains, 7 billion brains in one machine. It's going to be happening in 2050 to 2060. So our kids will definitely see this moment happening. So I mentioned to you earlier that this is not only happening in computers, it's happening in many, many other industries. You think about something like artificial intelligence, robotics, synthetic biology, um, energy systems, etc., etc. I just want to give you one more example. This is the cost of DNA sequencing. When we sequenced the full human genome for the very first time, it was a seven-year effort, a total of a 20-year effort if you take all the preparation into account. It cost us $2.7 billion. We did this in 1999. Massive breakthrough for human. In 2007, we did this the first time commercially for $350,000. So we go from $2.7 billion to $350,000. In 2014, a company in San Francisco came out called Illumina, brought out a machine. It sequences the human genome in an hour for $1,000. We go from $2.7 billion, only nation states can do it, to $1,000 a doctor can prescribe this within 15 years. Now, if you map this out, what you see on this graph, by the way, the, the uh, first part of the graph is a perfect exponential curve according to Moore's law. And then it, uh, we had a breakthrough in technology, and you see the price dropping um, very dramatically. You ask the experts and you say, where does this go? And our experts will tell you, it's going to go in the next five to ten years. Sequencing the human genome will effectively become free. It'll cost you a few cents. Now, what do you do with that? Here's an interesting idea. Uh, this is a toilet manufacturer called Toto. They very seriously consider having a toilet which sequences your human genome every single time you go on the toilet and gives you a full health report. A company which is today in the business of making ceramics really seriously considers being in the business of providing health uh, advice at the very least. I want to show you some, something else. Um, this is a short video I want to play. This is a, an artist from New York. And uh, I basically let her talk about herself. We don't know yet how our DNA might be used against us in the future. New York artist Heather Dewey Hagford. Heather Dewey Hagford. One artist in New York is making 3D models of people's faces, people that she's never met. She calls the project Stranger Visions. The strangers are people whose genetic material she finds on the sidewalks and subways of New York City. How much can I actually find out about you from something that you accidentally leave behind? This is the other side of technology. So we're moving really, really quickly into a future which will look dramatically different on many, many other, uh, on many, many dimensions than what we see today. And it's really important to understand this. 
So here's your so what. If you're not taking anything out of this, the one thing I want you to, to take out of it and go away with is that this technology future will come no matter what and will come faster than we think because it moves on an exponential trend curve. Remember when we talked about the rate of change at the beginning, like the 70-year change? If you take all of mankind's technology advances for the last 70 years between 1900 and 1970 and you index it, you see the same amount of change happening in the 30 years between 1970 and 2000. We see the same amount of change again happening bet between 2000 and 2010, and we see the same amount of change happening between 2010 and 2014. 70 years of technology change now happening in four years. This is the reason why when you pop up your head, you're like just in, in crazily concerned and, and confused. And like even I am looking up and I'm, I'm living this stuff and I just can't keep up with it anymore. And there's no sign that this will go slower. Remember, we are here. In a lot of these technologies, we're literally at this intersection point. And I want to leave you with a last quote, and this is my favorite quote of all times. This is George Bernard Shaw who said, the reasonable man adopts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in adopting the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man and woman. I believe fundamentally that we need to be and have to be unreasonable. Thank you. Pascal, lieber Pascal, sehr herzlichen Dank für diesen wirklich wunderbaren Vortrag mit dieser großen Vision, die du vorgestellt hast. Und vielleicht, meine Damen und Herren, werden sich jetzt über drei Dinge wundern. Äh, erstens, warum duzen wir uns? Zweitens, warum sprechen wir Deutsch? Und drittens, warum bleiben wir hier stehen und setzen uns nicht auf diese wunderbaren Stühle? Wir werden das auflösen. Äh, erstens, wir duzen uns, weil, weil du sagtest, Pascal, es gibt keinen Menschen, äh, den ich zum ersten Mal treffe und wir sehen uns heute zum ersten Mal, den ich nicht sofort duze, egal ob das ein CEO eines großen Unternehmens oder jemand anders ist. Wir reden Deutsch, weil du ursprünglich aus Köln kommst äh, und einen hugenottischen Namen trägst, aus Köln kommst, in Berlin gearbeitet hast und dann ähm, nach einem missglückten Versuch, ein eigenes Unternehmen zu gründen, in die USA gegangen bist. Und drittens, wir bleiben hier stehen, weil du der spirituelle Führer einer Bewegung ist, bist, die Gaishido Movement sich nennt. Get your shit done. Und ähm, es gibt sieben Gebote, sieben Gebote, die man befolgen muss, wenn man dieser Bewegung angehören möchte, der Get your shit done Bewegung. Und eines davon ist keine Meetings. Also entweder trifft man sich über Drinks, und setzt sich hin oder man bleibt stehen, wenn man was zu besprechen hat. Und das tun genau. wir jetzt auch entsprechend. Also, äh, wie wunderbar, äh, das vorgestellt zu bekommen. Vielleicht magst du einmal beschreiben, warum du aus Deutschland in die USA gegangen bist. Ähm, plötzlich dann so abrupt, so sehr, dass du yeah. eigentlich wirkst wie jemand, der nie woanders gewesen ist. Ja, ja, also ähm, ich glaube, mein Problem war immer, dass ich zu optimistisch für Deutschland war. Ich äh, erzähle Leuten immer, dass ich aus Deutschland rausgeschmissen wurde, weil ich zu optimistisch war. Ähm, und die Geschichte, die ich immer ganz gerne erzähle, ist, ist eine wahre Begebenheit, ist, äh, mein erstes Unternehmen, äh, was ich aus der Uni heraus gegründet habe, ist pleite gegangen. Das hieß DIN A6, ein sehr genau. deutscher Name noch. Ja, ja, DIN A6, genau. Und, ähm, das hat Grußkarten hergestellt. Ja, äh. Leider. Don't go there. <lacht> Don't go there. Ähm, dumme Idee, aber jemand hat irgendwie geglaubt, er müsste mir zweieinhalb Millionen Dollar dafür geben oder zweieinhalb Millionen Euro, D-Mark, sorry, äh, zu dem Zeitpunkt, untergegangen äh, in der großen Dotcom-Krise. Und ähm, wenn ich heute Leuten das noch erzähle, kriege ich sehr häufig in Deutschland diese Reaktion, oh mein Gott, du bist pleite gegangen, das ist ja schrecklich. Als ich das allererste Mal in den USA war, vor mehr als 20 Jahren, habe ich das einem relativ unbekannten, also einem Stranger in einem, in einem Café erzählt und der guckte mich an und sagte, wow, das ist ja super, was hast du gelernt? Und diese, diese, diese Grundeinstellung ist mir einfach so nahe, dass ich gesagt habe, ich muss da sein. Nun hast du selber am Ende auch gesagt, dass du selber confused bist, ja etwas durcheinander, was alles mit dem technologischen Wandel passiert. Du hast auf der einen Seite großen Optimismus gezeigt, auf der anderen Seite aber diese Sache mit der Toilette, das ist ja schon ein bisschen ein Horrorszenario vielleicht auch. Ähm, in was für eine Gesellschaft bewegen wir uns durch diesen ganzen Wandel? Ja, ich glaube, ein Punkt, der grundsätzlich wichtig ist zu unter verstehen, ist, Technologie an sich ist agnostisch. Ja? Technologie, du kannst ein Atom spalten, um äh, Energie zu erzeugen, du kannst ein Atom spalten, um, in, um Hiroshima in die Luft zu jagen. Dem Atom ist es egal. Ich glaube, es ist unsere Herausforderung und unsere Verpflichtung als Menschen, Technologie sinnvoll und gemeinnützig und gut, gutmützig äh, einzusetzen. Und das ist wahnsinnig wichtig und das ist halt auch, was wir an der Universität ja unterrichten. Aber das gut einzusetzen, wie groß ist die Wahrscheinlichkeit, dass das so sein wird? Weil das aus dem Silicon Valley, die kalifornische Herausforderung, das ist ja fast schon auch religiös geprägt, wenn man so hört, wie das ähm, ja, äh, vertreten wird. Ähm, 
ich glaube, dass wir, dass es äh, gerade in, in dieser Generation Millennials, also die, äh, die heranwachsende Generation, ich sehe sehr, sehr viele äh, aus meiner Sicht Kids, ja, also 20-Jährige, ähm, die mit sehr großem äh, Verantwortungsbewusstsein an die Sache rangehen und die sehen eben diesen großen Kontext, in dem wir uns bewegen in der Welt und äh, machen die richtigen Sachen. Mhm. Und ähm, du hast am Ende das Modell des Unreasonable Man vorgestellt. Äh, wenn wir alle rausgehen wollen und uns vornehmen, wir wollen hier Unreasonable Men and Women sein, ja. was müssen wir dafür tun, dass wir eben nicht uns von den Zeitläufen ändern lassen, sondern wir selber die Zeitläufe ändern? Wow, gute Frage. Ähm, ich glaube, äh, grundsätzlich geht es erstmal darum, einfach zu verstehen, was in der Welt passiert. Und das habe ich ja versucht, in den letzten 15 Minuten irgendwie äh, darzulegen oder zumindest so einen, einen Schnupperkurs zu geben. Ähm, und dann äh, generell... Ähm, Alan Kay, der so der, der Grundvater dieses Gedanken ist, ähm, der mal bei Xerox Park gearbeitet hat und unter anderem das grafische Benutzerinterface entwickelt hat, hat mal gesagt, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Und ich halte das für, für fundamental. Das ist die Idee, dass wir müssen die Zukunft, die wir haben, entwickeln. Und wir haben auch die Verpflichtung, sie zu entwickeln. Ansonsten passiert sie. Und dann sind wir nur passive äh, Spieler in diesem, in diesem äh, Game. Wie viele der Leute, die hier sind, müssen von reasonable zu unreasonable kommen, wenn sie hier rausgehen aus diesem Saal nach diesen Smashing Ideas, damit du trotzdem weiter optimistisch in die Zukunft schaust? Du, jeder hier liest ja die Zeit, das ist ja der Grund, warum die hier sind. Und deswegen sind die alle unreasonable automatisch. Ähm, nee, ganz ehrlich, also <lacht> Zeitleser automatisch unreasonable, ja. Ähm, also ich glaube, äh, für, die, für, die, für das Auditorium, für die Leser der Zeit ist es vielleicht viel mehr interessant irgendwie zu sagen, okay, wie kann ich denn nochmal 10% mehr mich in das Unreasonable lehnen? Mit diesem Appell zum 70. Geburtstag äh, an das Unreasonable sein, ähm, danken wir nochmal sehr, sehr herzlich Pascal Finett. Das war ein großartiger Einblick in das Denken aus Vielen Dank, dass du da warst. Danke dir.